Hello, everyone. Oh my gosh, we're getting a late start tonight. Uh, but uh, we're here. So I'm just going to just give everybody a few minutes to get in here. Okay, I hope you guys can hear me. Uh, if you can't, just let me know in the comments and we will, I will do my best to uh, get that figured out. Okay, so this is kind of a late start uh, live video. So I'm kind of just not organized, so please forgive me. The question that I would like us to pose is, what do children's television shows like Sesame Street, Teletubbies, Barney, all have in common with narcissism? Mm. Yeah, no picking on Elmo, no picking on uh, Grover, right? Leave Kermit the Frog alone and Miss Piggy. They're, they're off limits, right? Yeah, I know. I grew up with Sesame Street, too. And, uh, you know, I... I didn't let my children, I have four kids and they're adults now, and uh, I never let them watch Sesame Street. For some strange reason, I just like, mm -mm, no. And my youngest daughter, I was able to homeschool her and I had strict, strict rules put on her, man. She was barely allowed to watch TV. So I was caught off guard when I was researching for this video today. We're going to find out in this video, I'm just going to give you guys a pale understanding because I would really like you guys to do your own research and come back to the comment section of this video and share what you find out because I do believe there's a link to narcissism here. I may do a video on this, like not a live video, but I may gather all my evidence together and put it in a video. What do you guys think? Let me know if that's something that you guys want to do because on this channel, it seems like my viewers only want 10 minute long videos. I can't do 10 minute long videos. We're here to heal. You can't heal in 10 minutes. So, but if that's what you guys want, I've got to, I've got to do what you guys want me to do. So if you guys want me to uh, put out a video on this showcasing the research, all the research that I find, if I have to do this in a two part video, then I will, but it's up to you guys. You guys let me know. Okay. So right now I'm going to give you the research that I have, or just lightly touch on some of the things that I, I have found out. I, I wrote 10 pages in like two hours. I had two hours to put this together. So again, please excuse me, but I'm going to leave this video unedited because this has some juicy bits that you guys are going to want to stick to the end for. Okay. So we're going to talk about what Teletubbies, or I'm going to use Muppets, Oscar the Grouch. What do these characters, these puppet characters, have in common with narcissism? My name is Shannon Gilmore, and I would like to say thank you for joining me tonight. This is Positively Spiritual, a YouTube spiritual hub that helps you understand your spirituality by revealing to you your divine importance. I share with you psychological and scientific discoveries that when backed up with God's word can give us deep spiritual revelations that help us to discover ourselves, to discover our true life's purpose. Sound good? Oh yeah, it does. 
We are all about hope and healing on this channel. And I'd like to thank you for making this channel, Positively Spiritual, a part of your day. It is truly an honor to be here, and I could not be here without you all. So I want to say thank you because you guys have taken part in helping me to heal. And so this channel is a way to give back. So thank you. Now, I posted a video just a few hours ago. The narcissist cannot laugh. And in that video, I mentioned the count from Sesame Street. And just that little, little slight mention came this understanding and link to narcissism. I have personally learned over the years about narcissism. Bleh. Okay, let me say that again. I personally have learned about narcissism over the years through personal research into the psyche of the mind, the psychology behind narcissism from the de developmental stages in childhood. I mention it here in this book that I have wrote written and I want to read a little bit from this book to you today if we have some time. I don't want to make this a long drawn out video. I just want to share with you information that you can use that I do believe is extremely important. If you're a parent, if you're a teacher, if you're a caregiver, babysitter, if you watch over kids, if you're a nurse, Whoever you may be, maybe you're even a coach, whoever you may be, but you're involved in raising, teaching, guiding, leading children in some way, maybe you're a big sister or big brother, this video is going to help you, guaranteed. It's going to make you think, at least, and it'll make you reconsider. And if you do allow your children to watch these puppet shows like The Muppets and Barney and Sesame Street, Teletubbies, then take what you've learned from this video and share with your child, share with the child that's in your care the reason why we shouldn't be like Oscar the Grouch or we shouldn't be like um, Grover or we shouldn't be like Cookie Monster. Miss Piggy, no, no, nobody likes her. Nobody would like her on the playground. I believe you mean nobody would like her. Sometimes I would love to punch her face in, but I didn't say that. Kermit the Frog, push over. No, sorry. Okay. I digress. Yeah, I'm picking on the, the characters because I find them a little bit obnoxious. And uh, yeah, we all have our characters of the Muppets whom we just, mm. yeah, anyway. So anyways, so this video today comes from a video that I posted earlier on today about why the narcissist can't laugh. In that video, I talked about the count and the count's laugh is literally uh, uh, uh. Have you ever noticed? And in that video, I said that narcissists kind of laugh like the count. It's like one, uh, 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 two, uh, 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 three, uh, uh, uh. I literally have known a narcissist who laughs like that. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, seriously. Yeah, I'm not kidding. I am not kidding. I may have exaggerated a little bit, but yeah, I'm not kidding. So what kinds of behavior has the Muppets taught our children? Yeah, Big Bird, Elmo, even Oscar the Grouch, they're guilty of leading our kids astray. They have not taught our children properly 
the lessons in morality or empathy. From a developmental psychological perspective, I would like to know if anybody has conducted studies on the harm puppets have had on developing minds. Maybe somebody should ask the psychologist Jordan Peterson. Mm. He does wonderful uh, critiques on childhood uh, cartoons like um, I've watched one that he did on Pinocchio. Uh, he dives into the psyche with, of the mind within Pinocchio. And he, I think he did one on the Little Mermaid, or somebody did. Um, but this needs to be brought to our attention because Muppets are harming our kids. The brain cannot tell the difference between reality and fantasy. Kids don't know the difference, and they shouldn't know the difference. Because God tells us that we are to have a childlike mind, and as adults, we lost the ability to play. We lost the ability to creatively play and to fantasize and to play pretend. Now, Muppets, Barney, Sesame Street, they taught, bleh, they taught our children social skills, language, uh, counting. But at what cost? Seriously, it's not normal for kids to interact with puppets. Kids on TV interact with talking creatures that look like toys. Now, Although these puppets sound human, they are not human. And I know as a parent, allowing my kids to watch TV, minimal Sesame Street, I never once said, you guys realize that that's not real, right? That's a guy who's got his hand, you know, in the puppet talking. And his voice is talking for the puppet. This isn't real, kids. What parent says that to their children? Um, my parents never said it to me, and I was raised on Sesame Street. Some of my childhood traumatic memories are having the Sesame Street play in the background while my mother slept off her, her toxic, she was an alcoholic, so while she was sleeping that off, I would be sitting in front of the TV watching Sesame Street and the electric company and other TV shows like uh, Finnegan and um, the one about the giant, um, the friendly giant. Uh, what about Mr. M um, oh, I forget. There's so many uh, 70s and 80s TV shows for kids. And a lot of them had puppets. Even Mr. Dress Up had puppets. Um, the friendly neighborhood. What's that, that guy? Um, uh, won't she be my neighbor? That guy, they had puppets. Puppets are not healthy for kids, and I'm just discovering this now. I wouldn't have thought anything of it if I didn't know anything about narcissism. But suddenly, just talking about the count just kind of opened my mind up to this possibility, and it's like, holy shit. I contributed to my children's bad behavior. Thank you, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. He was an awesome man. So was Mr. Dress Up. Awesome, awesome people. Um, Fred Penner was always my favorite. But again, these people had puppets. Even, even Sharon, Lois, and Bram, they had the elephant, but it didn't talk or did it. No, I don't think it talked, which was a good thing. But the thing is, like, we have a society that is bringing narcissistic personality disorder in our face. And 
I'm getting tired of talking about it. I want to talk about God. I want to talk about healing. I want to talk about other things like eating disorders. and But all of that is from trauma. Like there's so many eating disorders, behavioral disorders, addictions. Sorry, I just cut out there. Hope we're back. Okay, so there's so many disorders that we need to be talking about, but they can all be stemmed back from trauma. And trauma is from narcissism. So here we have Barney. I, I mean, I my youngest was raised on Barney. And, you know, I like the songs. I even can go for a walk and there's this one person who I see quite frequently and she's riding her bike and she's like, I love you, you love me. And I end up singing with her as she rides by me because it's like, I relate to you. High five, girl. But now that I know more about narcissism, I'm just like, holy moly. Like, this is not good. Seriously, not good. The human brain at a young age is extremely impressionable, like extremely impressionable. You guys know that when you find a baby bird, you have to be very careful because that bird will impress, impress itself upon you. Like it will, like your mannerisms will be imprinted on them if, if that bird hatches and you're the first thing it sees or first person it sees, it's going to think that you're its parent. Oh yeah, that's how impressionable the mind is. And a child's development, when they're in their developmental stages from five to seven years is a very precious, precious, precious time of development. It all is precious right from in the womb. But the brain is actually stimulated by facial gestures, body language, combined with the tone of voice. And this helps us to communicate with one another. How the hell is Elmo, Big Bird, Mr. Snuffleupagus, Grover, Kermit the Frog ever going to show us these expressions of the face, including those micro expressions the body language, how are they ever going to show us, our children, real anger, real sadness, or real joy? Have you ever heard of Elmo's laughter? That's pretty narcissistic. Ha, 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 ha. You know, when Tickle Me Elmo came out, I was just like, no, my children are never getting that freaking toy. Never. And all you would hear is going down the toy aisle, some kid would, you know, tickle Elmo and you'd hear for ages. Ha 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 This toy was the best invention ever, but it was also the worst. We have puppets. Okay, just just bear with me because we have puppets who cannot show proper body language that we desperately need. If you guys have learned anything from mask wearing during the pandemic, I mean, I went on my Instagram channel when that when we first entered the lockdowns, I was freaking on fire. I was a mad hatter. I was mad. Because as a life coach, peer support mentor, I was helping people guide them through depression, anxiety, and suicide. And to have Canada come out with statistics saying that because of COVID and the lockdowns, suicide was on the rise at least 22 to 35% more and the, the domestic violence between families 
not just husband and husband or spousal abuse, it was child abuse was rising. I was freaking livid. And then we had to walk around with masks. Well, I didn't, but there are people who believe that mask wearing, even now, in 2024, there are people who believe that mask wearing is still should be mandatory. And I'm not dismissing. I want to be respectful to everybody. However, the where I get upset at mask wearing is we were not born with a mask. If God wanted us to wear a mask for the rest of our lives to bed, when we make love to our spouses, when we eat at restaurants, when we go for exercise, when we go for a swim, if God wanted our mouths to be covered up, he would have had us born with a freaking mouth shield as skin over, like foreskin over our mouths. Okay, that's my rant. I'm trying to calm down. I'm trying to calm down here, okay? Yeah, I'm trying to calm down. Okay, so I would like to read to you a quote from the website called scanva.org. I will post a link to this article in the description after this video is over. Social development refers to the process by which a child learns to interact with others around them. As they develop and perceive their own individuality within their community, they also gain skills to communicate with other people and process their actions. Social development most often refers to how children develop friendships and other relationships. <clears throat> as well as how a child handles conflict with peers, end quote. Make a mental note of that. Social development also refers to how well a child handles conflict with peers. I know some parents back when I was a child, like I said, I was raised on TV and I know as when I was a mother, I met other parents who let the TV be the babysitter. So what I'm trying to have us understand that for some parents, many, 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 many parents who raised latchkey kids, that's kids who basically raise themselves, who come home after school and raise themselves on TV. Now it's YouTube. Um, but I mean, what kind of programs are kids watching today? Even when TV started, when in the 60s, I mean, Sesame started, I think the first, first uh, episode was 1969. So from the late 60s, like what kind of society have we created? And I think we can ask, answer that for ourselves because we can see it. We have created a narcissistic society, society because of TV. That's just my opinion but it's probably fact from some other scientific research out there. So does this article jump out at you? It did me because reading the last sentence, well, reading all of it, but the last sentence that child, social development refers to how a child handles conflict within their with their peers. I mean, adult narcissists have conflict with their peers. They make conflict. They're crazy makers. Narcissistic behavioral disorder is behavioral disorder for a reason. How well do narcissists handle conflict with their peers? They don't. They don't. And... I was watching 
just before I started this live video, I was found a skit of Oscar the Grouch from 12 years ago. And I'm going to read you the skit because it freaking jumped out at me. And I never, I never saw this. I never saw this coming. So kids learn from Sesame Street and other puppet shows. They, they learn by the vocal tone. And kids learn at an early age how to laugh, how to cry, how to speak to each other, how to speak to their parents, how to speak to themselves, how to get across their needs through speech. Now, this is the kind of character that, you know, we're having our children look up to, Oscar the Grouch. This is totally against God. If if we want to get um, get our Jesus freak on, I guess if you want to call it, you know, um, I don't care. I'm not being insulting to Jesus or religion or spirituality at all. Call me a Jesus freak. Give that compliment to me. I'll 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 take it. I'll absorb it because we have to get this fanatical because. Jesus had us focus on love. When you look at his teachings, he teaches us, don't do this, do this instead. Don't harm your neighbor, love your neighbor instead. Don't resist an evil person, just let them hit you instead. Yeah, it sounds kind of odd, right? Well, it sounds odd because of the society that we live in. It sounds odd to be nice to your someone who hates you because of the society that we've created. And here we have puppets, puppets raising our children. I mean, cartoons are just as bad as puppets. Bugs Bunny. I mean, Wile E. Coyote chasing Roadrunner, like, and Bugs Bunny was kind of a sarcastic, narcissistic kind of dude. So let's just look at Oscar the Grouch. This is pretty telling, okay? Now, Again, kids, when they watch puppets, all they're going to really learn from is the vocal tone of the speech. Now, the child may see the puppet furrow its brow just a little, but kids are learning from these puppets what they see, mimicry. Birds can mimic many different tones. They can mimic their owner's voice. They learn by mimicry. Children learn the same way. That's our parents set the example for us to follow when we are young. But when the child is placed in front of the TV, here, watch, watch this big bird for a little while while mommy goes makes dinner. That half hour long program is enough to get into the subconscious mind and do wonders. Wonders that are no good. So kids are not taught the fundamental human behavior that is seen through unique body language or mannerisms or the structures that are unique to the human individual. I mean, this makes sense. You're a talking puppet. Kids don't know that that puppet's made out of, out of material. Kids don't know that the puppet's filled with fluff. And adults don't tell their children this, that it's not real. God had a specific way for us to teach our children. He said, 
teach your children the way that they should go. And when they are older, they will not leave it. Nobody raised me on Jesus. I came to Jesus when I was in my early 20s because I did something stupid. I used an Ouija board that had me spiritually attacked for over 20 years. And that experience had me run into the arms of Jesus. And what he teaches is a lot about human nature. But we're, we're seeing the wrong side of human nature. And we're having to navigate ourselves out of that through living through trauma. This isn't the way that Jesus wanted it. He didn't want us to learn the ways of trauma, to heal from trauma so that we could learn his love. No, he wanted our parents and our parents' parents and parents before our parents. He wanted the generations to teach the future generations about love first. That was the Hebrew way. Can you just imagine this for a second? You have, okay, we're going to keep these numbers small just so that you can understand this because this is amazing. You have a hundred people, okay? And 50 out of those hundred people are parents. So 50 of those hundred people are adults and 50 of those hundred people are children. The 50 parents teach the 50 children the ways of love unconditional love. God says, you're supposed to teach your children when you walk along the, okay, how is it? It goes, teach your children when you get up, when you sit at the table to eat breakfast and dinner and lunch, when you walk along the road, that means when you're going from here to there, there was no driving back then, obviously. But when you're walking along the road to go get water, to go and buy clothes, going to the market to get your food, going to the Sea of Galilee to go fish with your children, talk about God to your children. And God said, when you lay your head down on your pillow, teach your kids. Talk to your children at night about God. Now, the esoteric communities who promote law of attraction, they are now teaching us that meditation at night before you go to sleep, have your thoughts focused on good things so that when you wake up in the morning, those good things that you think about before you fall asleep are imprinted in your subconscious. And science proves this, that this is true. Science proves that there are five brain waves in here and they don't stay in here they leak out and how they leak out they they call it the aura but the bible would call it spirit the light that emanates from the body is energy and that energy is impregnated with our thoughts and our feelings that go out into this harvest field. Science calls it ether. I do believe Jesus was mentioning the harvest field, the ether, the space between me and the wall. The space between us is not empty. It's intelligent. And so science is teaching us to think on good things before we go to sleep instead of focusing on the bad things that happened during the day, focusing on the bad things that happened a week ago, a month ago, two years ago, the boyfriend lost, the, the narcissistic crap that you endured five years ago 
it's time to let that go. It's time to allow yourself to heal from that. It's time to allow yourself to heal from the trauma and expect good things for yourself. But it's hard to do that when we are so bogged down with negativity. It's hard to focus on good things when you try to go to sleep at night because you're worried about the next day. You're worried about what you're going to go through the next day. And guess what? When you worry and you have that those thoughts before you go to sleep at night, that is what you're putting out there into this harvest field. And you're going to harvest that right back to you that next day. Hi, Sergio. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Diane. Thank you guys for joining. Um, so it's hard to think about good things when you go to sleep. But if you can just think of one good thing that happened during your day and make that your focus and thank God for that and allow yourself to fall asleep thanking God, the battle is won. But just think about this. Like I mentioned, you have a hundred people who are focused on God, who are focused on talking about God wherever they go, whatever they do, when they lay their head down on the pillow, they're tucking their kids in at night and talking about God to their children. What are they sowing for the next day? Love. When they go and greet their neighbor, they're shaking hands, hugging and kissing, you know, each other on the cheeks, greeting each other in friendship and love and kindness. They're not greeting each other in sarcasm. This was the way the Hebrew lifestyle was. They were rooted in love because they were taught love. We don't have this now. Instead, we have the teaching of Oscar the Grouch as a mentor, as a guide. And I watched a skit on YouTube from Sesame Street. That was 12 years ago. And it was called Oscar's Cell Phone. And I was taken back at his freaking sarcasm. And the lack of phone etiquette between the girl, Gina, who worked at the Hooper's store, and Oscar himself. Now, Oscar, he tries out his phone. He's, he gets a new cell phone, and he's trying out his cell phone and showing the public that, you know, you can dial really fast and all this stuff with the cell phone. So he's like, hmm, I wonder who to phone. And so he phones Gina at the Hooper store. And right away, Gina, she doesn't know who's calling, but she answers the phone in a half because she's busy. Well, again, that's that alone, that behavior from Gina, from a human, is bad behavior because it's teaching our children a terrible work ethic. When I was working at 14 years old, 15, 16, 17 years old, I was taught service with a smile. Customer is always right. Now, it doesn't mean that you let customers belittle you, but I remember answering the phone. My grandfather, he taught me. My grandfather, when I was a little girl, he taught me manners. And they are still here rooted in me today. Teach your child the way that they should go. And when they're older, they will never leave it. And my foster parents, when I would answer their phone and I would say hello and I would answer, yes, please, no, thank you. Oh, just one moment, please, I'll go get my mom for you. I would be so polite. And my mom's friends mentioned that to my, my foster mom. Shannon is so polite. And I remember them saying that, not to toot my own horn, but watching this little skit, Gina answers the phone, Hooper Store, not like all smiling or anything. It's like she's in a huff, like Hooper Store. It was almost like her voice was saying, yeah, what do you want? I got to go. Hurry up. 
And so she answers the phone and Oscar is on the other end. And Oscar phones the store and he tells Gina why he's calling her because he's checking out his phone. And she's like, yes, Oscar, your phone works. Click. There's no goodbye. There's no etiquette. There's no thanks for calling. Um, I hope this has helped you, Oscar. Have a good day. Whatever. There's there's not even Oscar is a grouch. So, of course, he's not going to say have a nice day. And if he does, it's going to be sarcastic. But this human teacher on the TV who is playing the role of a person who works at the store, she answers the phone. Immediately, I saw red flags. Now, I don't want to go on and on and on about Gina. This is about Oscar the Grouch and about puppets. So Oscar phones a second time. And when Gina answers, he says, without saying hello, he doesn't identify himself. He says, well, that took you long enough. Seriously? That's not how children or anyone should answer the phone. If somebody ever talked to me like that on the phone, I'd be like saying, um, sorry, this is my phone. You just abused the power that I have given you by using my phone number like this. I've got to go. I'm, you don't have a right to talk to me like that, so I'm not going to entertain that. Like, no way. And sure, shoot, and I'm not going to be so readily available for you if you ever phone me a second time. Exactly. Children parrot that. And that's what had me so, like, I'm sitting here watching this, thinking that I'm going to, like, thinking that I was going to get something different as I wanted something different for this video. I wasn't expecting to see narcissism. I wasn't expected to see, or I wasn't expecting to see sarcasm. I wasn't expecting to see rude behavior. Mm -mm. Sorry, Oscar. Mm -mm. You're grounded in the corner for you. Five minute time out. No, longer than five minutes. You get that phone taken away. So kids are not going to get this innuendo. Well, that took you long enough. They're not going to get it. Like Diane said, they're just going to parrot it. And they're going to mimic that tone, expecting to be catered to just like Oscar was with Gina. Oscar was not mindful of him infringing on Gina's time. He never apologized or faked any empathy. He showed no empathy. So we know that narcissists do not have empathy and the role of Oscar the Brooch is clearly narcissistic. Psychologists are teaching us and telling us that narcissism comes from overweening parents, the helicopter parent, or the parent who dismisses the child. Yes, that is true, but it's not always true, or at the very least, these puppets are reinforcing the narcissistic tendencies in children. That's where I'm having the problem. So Gina hangs up on Oscar without saying goodbye, without saying thank you for calling, without any proper polite etiquette. She still shows annoyance when she answers the phone and she tells Oscar that she is busy. She doesn't have time to help Oscar out. She understands that Oscar is kind of playing a game. It's Adults will understand that. He's playing a twisted game with her. But the fact that she doesn't know who's calling and she's already annoyed before she answers the phone, that's wrong. And then when she answers the phone and she realizes it's Oscar, doesn't matter. Oscar may be her friend. He may be one of the community. 
He may be a regular. It doesn't matter. He's still a customer. He's phoning the store. She should treat him as a customer, polite and kind. Now, my question is, what the hell happened to all these manners that should be there? This skit was created 12 years ago. And we've seen a growing trend. If um, you go to a fast food restaurant, you go to the, the express, you know, the drive-in, you go to a coffee stop, shop, donut stop, you stop at the drive-in. And I mean, it's you order your stuff and already the the person at the counter has change ready for you and they don't even know what kind of bills you're going to show them this was pre-covid now everything is done through debit card and credit card and hardly anybody uses cash anymore i still do but but i i was amazed and no service with a smile it's like I can now see watching this 10 minute skit from Oscar the Brooch 12 years ago. I can totally see where these kids who are working and filling these job positions, they have no freaking etiquette. They act like they don't want to be there. They're just putting in their time for a freaking paycheck. We're supposed to work. When we work, we work for the Lord. We're supposed to be joyful when we work. I worked for a hoarder for seven months. And every day going into work, I'm sitting there or standing there amongst mass. And before my healing of trauma, that situation would have had me freaking squirrely. But I'm standing in mess and clutter and i just take it in stride and i'm happy and i'm smiling and laughing and thinking good thoughts in my head and and working for the lord knowing that okay today i'm dusting to today i'm putting stuff in boxes today i'm organizing today i'm doing whatever and I trip over stuff. I have bruises on my legs because I bang into stuff. I've broken plates and broken glasses because I've turned and oops, not something over, you know, but every day was a learning lesson. Every day I didn't, don't like working for a hoarder. Glad I'm not one, but the person was such a became a friend uh and i learned a lot i learned a lot about myself i learned a lot about narcissism i learned a lot about human behavior i i learned and i'm thankful for the experience but never never did i show up putting in my time for the money never did i show up saying i'd rather not be here never did i show up grumpy ass chip on my sho shoulder, attitude, no. I was in somebody else's house. I gave them respect. This person has me in their house five hours a day. It's not my house, not my place to bitch and complain or say anything. You show respect. And I've noticed that you ask for something, you go to a hardware store, you go to, I don't know, a grocery store, you ask for something politely, they look at you like, oh, it's over there in aisle six somewhere. It's like you got to find stuff yourself. And very rarely will you say, hear people say please and thank you. So going back to this skit, because this goes further, Oscar calls a third time and Gina is now in a huff and she states she's busy and hangs up on him. 
Oscar, I'm busy. I can't talk right now. I'm busy washing dishes. Click. To which he looks at the audience with his googly eyes. Oh yeah, there's something about those eyes. We're going to get to those in a minute. But he looks at the audience and he says, what a grouch. Now along comes a neighbor who notices Oscar's phone and asks to use it. Oscar immediately says no. The neighbor says, why no? Exactly, they're teaching disrespect. Classic signs of narcissism right here. And how old are children watching Sesame Street? Toddlers? Pre-toddler age? Oh yeah. So this neighbor kind of gets into it with Oscar a little bit and asks, why can't I use it? I, it's just a phone. And, but as soon as the neighbor says, I want to go call Gina. I just want to talk to her for a moment. I want to call her at the store. Then Oscar in a condescending tone says, oh, you want to call Gina? Be my guest. And he goes, hey, hey, hey. Yeah. So the neighbor dials the phone, gets Gina on the phone, and Gina is still busy, answers the phone in a half because she's thinking it's Oscar. And before she answers the phone, she's like wiping her hands off because she was in dishwater and her hands are all soapy. And, and she's like, the phone's ringing in the background and she's like, Oscar, I'm so busy. I don't have time to talk to you. So she answers the phone and she picks up the phone and she just lets Oscar have it. Oscar, I'm on the phone or Oscar, I'm so busy. I can't talk to you. Why do you keep phoning me? And when she pauses, the owner of the store, the neighbor, says, Gina, are you always this grouchy when you answer the phone in my store? Now, can you guys think of a better way for this owner to be talking to her? Because this is kind of like condescending and narcissistic. So Gina sheepishly backpedals and she explains to the store owner that Oscar has been calling her all day. No, he hasn't. This is the fourth. Well, he called her three times, not all day, but three times in a row. So again, this usage of all day is an overgeneralization that most narcissists use and people in trauma also use it too. You never do this for me. You're always doing that. And, you know, it's, it's overgeneralization and it's very hurtful kind of speech. So the neighbor gets off the phone and is upset at Oscar and asks Oscar, why did you allow the phone call to happen when you knew that I was going to call Gina and you knew that Gina was going to be upset. And Oscar gaslights Mr. Humphrey, or Hanford, sorry. Yeah, classic narcissistic tone. And Oscar says this, and I quote, what are you talking about? It was your idea to call Gina. And then he says, it wasn't my fault. I tried to talk you out of it. No, he didn't. Mr. Hanford doesn't give Oscar any consequence and instead just walks away annoyed. And Oscar has the last laugh and the final say. And he looks at the audience and he says, well, that's what I get for being so nice. Yeah. 
I didn't like Sesame Street 30 years ago or 20 years ago, and I still don't like Sesame Street. I mean, I've read books. What is there is a book that was one of my kids' favorite, The Monster at the End of This Book. And it was Oscar. And Oscar, it was cute. And, you know, Oscar is like, there's a picture of Oscar holding the corner of the, the page of the book. And he says, don't turn the page. And then you turn the page and Oscar's like on the next page. I told you not to turn the page because now we're one, st one page closer to the end of the book. Please, please, please don't turn this page. And so you have to turn the page, right? I told you not to turn the page. My kids just loved it when I read it like that, right? And so I read these books to my kids, but I found Oscar watching him on Sesame Street, I found him dumb and obnoxious. Oscar was a grouch and rude and mean and nasty. Uh, Telly was dense. Uh, Big Bird, well, he was kind of not with it sometimes, but he could be smart. Um, Zoe, her voice was annoying. Don't even get me started on Elmo, please. Don't, don't go there. Don't, don't go there. Elmo. La 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 la, la 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 la, Elmo's world. La 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 la, la 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 la. Elmo's world. Da, 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 da. Oh, yeah. Nah. <clears throat> okay. I babysat when I was a teenager kids who loved Sesame Street and Elmo. Mm. Okay. So I didn't realize until watching this skit how narcissistic Sesame Street really is. And how the adults, like Mr. Humphrey, he actually enabled Oscar the Grouch's behavior. Now, we know that everybody at Sesame Street caters to Oscar the Grouch because he's a grouch. He can't help himself. He is the way he is. Oh. Oh. Yeah, everybody enables Oscar. Mm. I really didn't want to talk about narcissism like this when I started this video. But these Muppet characters, they got to be called out. And as I was watching Oscar in the skit, something just kind of popped out at me. His googly eyes. They're obviously dead, okay? Do narcissists not give you the dead stare? Googly eyes obviously show no emotion. Now, I'm wondering, since kids are so impressionable, like, I, I talk about in this book, the five, the five brain waves. And I talk about the theta brain wave, how the theta brain wave is your subconscious. And mannerisms and behavior and feelings from your childhood are imprinted onto your theta wave. And after the age of seven, your theta wave, which is the, the dawn, it's, it's the dominant brainwave, but when you're seven years old, it's still the dominant brainwave, but it basically works behind the scenes subconsciously. So then when you're seven, it's your alpha brainwave that works your awareness, your conscious awareness. So it's like your alpha and your theta wave when you're younger have a different role, like they switch roles, not roles, they switch dominating natures 
when you're an adult. So when you're a child, it's your theta wave that's dominating and works in the front scenes of your comings and goings. But when you're seven, it just switches roles and it still remains dominant, but it's kind of like on the back burner, like it's hidden. And your alpha wave becomes more dominant and your alpha becomes your your awareness, like your conscious awareness. And so I talk about in this book, Feral Children, and I also talk about the developing brain in the child. And I'm wondering that this these personas that these puppets portray and the googly eyes, I'm wondering if they have a negative effect that is imprinted on the theta wave that becomes hidden and dormant, but it comes out as a personality and personality traits and mannerisms of the adult narcissist. So there might be something to this because have you ever heard of senpaku eyes? This is a Japanese term that means three whites, three whites. The senpaku eyes is like the whites of your eyes, you know. Um, now, you can Google this and look this up for yourself. But if the whites of a person's eyes are visible either above or below the colored portion or the iris of your eye, that person is said to have Sampaku eyes. And see, you can tell mine, I don't have Sampaku eyes. And you can tell that just from this, there's certain types, like if, if you can see the white above the iris, it means something, some sort of behavioral problem. And if you can see it below, then there's a different behavioral problem. And if you see all around the iris whites, you know, like the bug eyes, when you widen your eyes and they go, oh, I can't even do it. I won't even, I, I can't even do it. Okay. But there is there are some people who can widen their eyes when they talk and it's not a good thing. And there is um, somebody famous who promotes narcissism who loves to, and it's, I think it's just an unnatural behavioral or a not, sorry, I don't want to say behavioral trait. That's wrong. I came out wrong. It's just a natural trait that comes out in this person but it's always given me bad vibes because psychologists say that when somebody bugs their eyes out like this, like like the, all the whites around their whole eye show, like um, there was a famous psychopath, murderer, killer, who has these types of psychotic eyes. I can't remember his name. I don't even want to mention his name. But um, Helter Skelter, look up his name and you'll you'll know who I'm talking about. And those are the kind of eyes when someone's talking and they just go wide-eyed when they're talking. It's unnerving. And psychologists have said that that's not a good sign that someone does that. You said it, Sergio. You said it, not me. I respect this person. Thank you, Sergio. You called the evil one out too. Thank you. Oh, Diane, I didn't know Adam Schiff had those kind of eyes. Oh, yeah, he does, doesn't he? Mm. Shifty Schiff, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so I'm wondering if 
narcissism when you're a little child watching Sesame Street as it becomes your babysitter, as it becomes your go-to TV to watch. Maybe there's some sort of imprinting there where that googly-eyed stare kids mimic and maybe they can mimic well without emotion. Maybe it's a mimicked behavior. I don't know. I'm not a psychologist. I'm just sharing this with you for you to do your own research as this is something that is of concern. It is for me. We're all about saving the children here. And I'm just like, I did not really prepare for this video because I wanted to get this, this information out as it was coming downloaded to me because this needs to be said. So the next thing that I want to talk about is staying on this website that I mentioned um, about childhood behavior. Um, just a second here. Um, okay, so the website again is from scamva.org. Okay, so... I just wanted to quickly read this to you because scrolling down this web page, I read infants and toddlers during the first two years of life, this child, they learn to smile and react positively to those who care for them. They also develop stranger anxiety. They develop an attachment to comfort objects such as a blanket or a teddy bear. They show anxiety around other children and they imitate other children and adults, even animals. And they are affected by the emotions of their parents and others around them. So as toddlers and infants, children relate to or react to emotion. Now at a website called kidsconnect.com, there is an article titled Nonverbal Communication in Children and why body language is so important for development. And I, as being a parent of four kids, know that emotions and body language go hand in hand. You can't separate the two. And um, this article, just, just, I'll, I'll post a link to the article in the description at the end of this video, live video. Sorry, I was reading the comments and I want to, I want to jump into your guys's conversation, but I got to get through this stuff first. So you guys just talk amongst yourselves. This, you guys are giving good conversation. Thanks. So I, I would like to read from this article, nonverbal communication with a child at a young age has a big effect on their relationships with friends and family. It can also play a significant part of their emotional development and their sense of worth. So just think about that and the behavior and the emotions that are shown from a Muppet from a puppet, a hand puppet. There's no emotions to think of. There's barely any body, well, there's no human body behavior. This is really important to understand because our kids are learning from puppets, inanimate objects. So there are five nonverbal communication methods that are important for children to learn. Body movement, touch, eye contact, facial expressions, personal space. I remember in school where the teacher said, put out your hands to your side and make a big circle with your arms. That is your personal space. And that is a invisible boundary that you have the say-so 
whether someone can invade your personal space or not. You let them come close to you or not. And how you maintain this personal space is you back away or sidestep and you maintain your personal space around you. So using Oscar the Grouch, people walk up to his trash can, knock on the trash can, or if its lid is closed, no one can see his body language, no one can tell he's home, they invade his space, they just open up the lid and say, hey, Oscar, are you there? Are you home? They don't, they don't politely, they just invade his space. And when Oscar does pop up in the trash can, no one can really see his body language. Nobody can see when he wants his personal space. No one can see written on his face, his discouragement, his sadness, his anger, his grumpiness. No, it's all implied with his voice. So the only kind of, uh, the only kind of nonverbal communication cues that is shown by a puppet really is eye contact, so-called eye contact. And those googly eyes, moo, say it all, like seriously. So I'm just, I got to say this again. For you guys who are coming into this, thank you for watching. We're talking about Muppets and their con contribution to narcissism. It's, I just started researching this today and I'm just giving you some nuggets of information for you guys to do your own research if that interests you. But I gotta say again, those freaking googly eyes, man. Those googly eyes from those Muppets say it all. Because you ever wonder why a narc can actually stare right through you? Oscar the Brooch taught some children to do that. In fact, all of them have. I mean, look at Cookie Monster's eyes. They're sitting on top of his freaking head. And he, the, the old, what is it, the older or newer Oscar the Grouch? He moves and those googly black things move along with his eyes. It's like freaking freaky. Don't tell me that a child cannot learn by mimicry because those puppets, those people who are men in those puppets are narcissistic in the dialogue. So I, for one, am beginning to see how puppets pose a huge behavioral risk to our children. Now, those children who grow up watching Sesame Street or, or Teletubbies or Barney, I love you, you love me, we're a happy family with a great big hug and a kiss from me to you. Won't you say you love me too? Hello, everybody. I try. Teletubbies? Nah, won't go there. Okay. Now I just had Elmo's World playing in my head. La, 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 la. Elmo's World. Ugh. Cringe. Yeah, that's going to be a earworm all for the rest of the weekend. Yeah. So, our children are being taught the ways of narcissism from puppets and from Sesame Street. Now, when we look at narcissism, and I've done some videos on this, I've done two videos on uh, the recent one was last week or a few days ago. 
how to spot a liar. And then I did one a few years ago about micro expressions on the face. I forget what that one's called. Um, but uh, there's books by Dr. Er, yeah, the psychologist uh, Paul Ekman. And he teaches about uh, micro expressions. The famous one, duping delight, where someone kind of smirks just before, just before, like it's seconds, split seconds before they deny something. Like, no, I didn't, I didn't hurt the cat. I didn't pull the cat's tail. No, I, I, I didn't trip you on purpose. If you're not sure what to look for, you're going to miss it. But there are micro expressions, like even behavioral micro expressions, like a shirk of the shoulder, like one, one shoulder will lift up when someone is denying something or not being truthful. And these mannerisms are not taught. They're learned right from childhood. They are learned. And they're a way that your body processes whether someone is of integrity or not. These micro expressions through body language and facial expressions teach our children as they teach us when we're adults that somebody is trustworthy or not. But we haven't learned these micro expressions because guess what? We've learned from puppets. We've learned to dismiss and we've learned, some kids have learned to mimic puppets, mimic the flat faced stare. Maybe some kids have learned from Oscar the Grouch to say, I didn't do that. Well, it took you long enough without having the facial expressions to go with the tone in the voice. Facial expressions are extremely important. And in watching the skit, the 12 minute skit of Oscar the Grouch on the phone with Gina and watching Mr. Hamford enable Oscar's behavior, For one thing, okay, Mr. Hanford, when he was on the phone to Gina and he mistook her, her frustration as grumpiness. A grown adult mistakes another adult's frustration for grumpiness and says, you're not always this grumpy when you answer my phone, are you? Grumpiness was mistaken for frustration or annoyance. And that's teaching kids to wrongly assess our emotions. And I get it. It was Oscar's skit. So he was the king of the show. So he, there had to be a clap back to Oscar in that moment. I get it. But kids are not going to get it. So my point is this, that Muppets cannot teach our children lessons in humanity. And this is where we're failing humanity. We're failing society by failing our kids. And we wonder why narcissism is the way it is now. We wonder why our society is the way it is now. We've made it this way through, yes, parenting, but also through allowing our children to watch TV from people who are narcissistic or some of these people who were puppeteers have been proven to be pedos got to be careful what i say here and we allow our children to be babysat by the tv because we don't know as parents how to properly manage our time Oh, mommy's got to go cook dinner, so watch TV. Oh, mommy's got to go and make this important phone call. Watch TV. 
Mommy's got to go have a bath. Watch TV. Mommy's got to go and do laundry. Watch TV. Mommy's got to go and uh, write a report for her boss. I'll be in my office for two hours. Go watch TV. And some parents can't afford babysitters, so they raise latchkey kids where kids at a young age coming home from school, putting on the TV, watch, babysitting themselves. So I, I have something that I have to share with you is like I bought my daughter when she was three years old, like my youngest wasn't raised on TV. And I, cause my youngest, she's now in her early twenties. So over 20 years ago, I was already you know, pretty, pretty centered in my Christianity. So I was watching, being mindful what my kids watched on TV and Sesame Street was a no-go. So I, I bought my young daughter when she was three or four. I bought her an Eeyore because I personally like Eeyore, the cartoon. I like the donkey. I love donkeys. They are awesome, awesome creatures. And the story about Jesus riding on the donkey, there is deep study into that. Maybe we'll get into that on a study, Bible study session. Oh, yeah. By the way, I do have Bible study sessions. You want to hear about it? Go to my Ko-Fi channel. I'll have a link in the description below or below in the comments section. It's called A Study in His Word, and it is a membership program that you can get in on. And there's tons of com content for you to download. You have available to download a 200-page book called A Study in His Word, and it is a workbook study for you to read along with your Bibles. And it delves deep into the Hebraic message, into the deep dive, hidden wording of the messages of Jesus in his ministry in the book of Matthew alone. And also you have six newsletters that are 30 pages long for you to download with your membership. You have access to Bible study group or Bible study video if you want. So check it out on my Ko-Fi. I will have a link in the description. So yeah, we get into it. We get into Bible study. It's awesome. The deep Bible study is amazing. So anyways, I wanted to share with my daughter my love for Eeyore. So I bought her this little Eeyore plushie and you press the Eeyore's paw and he would sing and but his mouth wouldn't move but he would sing mm, good day to you and it is such a lovely day today it looks like rain is every day and it was it was a cute song, but it was scary. Like, really? I did the scary version of Eeyore. You know how Eeyore is kind of down. Hmm, it's a gloomy day today, you know? But because my daughter wasn't raised on puppets, hearing this voice come from an inanimate object that I'm going to say is like an idol, she cried. I made my little girl cry. She was terrified. As soon as I pressed it, it was like, mm, good day to you. It's such a rainy day today. It looks like rain all the day. She just looked at me and ah, starts crying. And I'm just like, so I put that thing away. Never touched it. Didn't have the heart to throw it out. But I never, never showed it to her. That was it. Never showed her any of those dolls or anything like anything that had a voice to it. Never bought anything like that because she taught me. She taught me 
her innocent ways taught me that mom, that's, that's scary. That's an idol. That's not natural. That's not real. That's not good. And so I never really thought of it as an idol, but I'm saying that to you now because after I've done this study today, I'm recognizing how we make things into idols where God says, you know, we pray to things that can't talk, can't speak, can't move, can't do things. But God's like, go ahead and have those. If that's what you want, go ahead. See if they're superior to me. And, uh, you know, I... Now that I'm further along in my Christianity, like I said in the beginning of this video, call me a fanatic. I'm, I'll take that compliment um, because God is really serious about us. He is so serious. He's a jealous God. He is serious. He is so serious that there is nothing that we can do that will cause him to leave us. That makes me want to cry. Can you just imagine somebody in your life right now that there is nothing aside from murder, but there is nothing that you could do aside from denying the Holy Spirit. There's no amount of fornication, no amount of drug use, no amount of swearing, no amount of abusing your body, no amount of being a horrible person and and taking people for granted aside from narcissism there is no amount of sin that we who love god we who truly love god there is no amount of sin that god will say go away from me i never knew you he says that to the people who serve him in vain but us who truly love him, we make mistakes. And there is no amount of mistakes that we can make that God will say, girl, Shannon, come on. You get yourself together because I'm this far, I'm this close to leaving you. For the narcissist, the Spirit of God has already left that temple a long time ago. They're the people that serve God in vain. But God loves us so much. Exactly, Diane. I have loved you with an everlasting love, with loving kindness. I have drawn you, declares the Lord. Jeremiah 31, 3, that makes me want to cry. So this video is for you. This is for him. Um, I was a little bit not prepared for this video as much as I wanted to be. But I hope you get the gist of this because God loves us. And we're here to shine his love. And we show God that we love him. Gosh, I'm starting to cry. We show him that we love him by doing our best in this world. And I know I haven't done my best. I haven't been my best. And I've failed a lot of people and I've failed myself. But I know this. Um, I still remember this like it happened yesterday. Um, I was at a very sad place in my life. Um, my ex-husband had revealed to me that he had cheated. Um, and it took him four years to confess that. And he had cheated on me with some other woman. And he confessed it to me two days before he was supposed to go on this big quest. And he left me with this heartache and my hair started falling out because when my ex told me this our daughter was attacked by a german shepherd and she had 
bite marks all over her face, her head, her neck, her arms, her, not her, I don't think her neck, it was her shoulder. And um, so, you know, I was just dealing with that and I turned to God and I said, God, I feel like I'm failing you. My life's a mess. I feel like I'm failing you because the more I reach for your cloak, the more empty handed I feel. And I was looking up at the night sky on the porch. And all of a sudden I had this, this thought that Jesus just came down from heaven and, uh, and stood in front of me. And I sat down in the lawn chair and I just had this vision of him just kneeling down in front of me, holding my hand and saying, you're not failing, you're growing. And that was all I needed to hear to pick me up myself back up as he gave me strength and I could just carry on through the day. And I did, I mustered through those feelings of knowing that the love of my life was not the love of my life. Jesus is the love of my life, but at that time, I thought my husband was gifted to me from the Lord and that he was my forever guy. You know, and here I was questioning everything. I questioned my womanhood, my femininity. I questioned my, my role as a wife, a mother, a woman. I was questioning everything. Like, I just felt like, what the hell? I've been living a lie. And... I had to deal with those feelings on my own because I tried reaching out to my ex-husband. I tried reaching out to him to get answers and to, to bridge the gap. And, and I tried to understand. I tried to get him to help me to understand. And he would just argue with me. God got me through. It was God who helped me wrestle with those feelings and God put everything to rest. Took a long time, but it he he helped me. And so God is there to help you. We're here to help each other. So I'm thankful for you guys. I'm thankful for this teaching today. I'm thankful for all of it. I'm thankful for the lessons learned. I'm thankful for the trauma. Doesn't mean I love the trauma. I freaking hate it. I hated it. I hated going through it. But it's something that when you come out on the other side of trauma, it's something that you can look at and you can say, I've been blessed for it. Because I know what I know. Had I not known narcissism, I wouldn't have known the be mind of a child, the behavior of a child, the developmental stages of a child. I wouldn't have researched feral children chapter in this book. I wouldn't have researched my own development, my own symptoms of abuse. I wouldn't have researched why I am the way I am. I wouldn't have gotten to know me. Do you know how many people do not know themselves? Narcissists don't know themselves, but there are other people who don't know themselves that are just happy to live on the knowledge that they learned 30 years ago. They're not work in progress. They're stagnant pawns as the Bible teaches. And I remember when I started learning about God, I kept saying, God, don't make me a stagnant pool. I don't want that. Don't make me stagnant, please. And he answered that. So I hope you got something from this video today. And the subject is so deep. And I, if I can, I, if you guys will allow this, don't mind. We've already been here at an hour and 34 minutes. Wow, thank you for sticking around. But I want to read you just 
um, from page 19 in this book because I think it's really important. Uh, the chapter is called "Where Does Narcissism Where Does Narcissism Come From?" And this is the the first book part of this book is the clinical psychological perspective, but then the middle of the book you get to I I talk about the biblical aspects of narcissism. So, where does narcissism come from from a psychological point? perspective. And I write, narcissism is a normal stage of early childhood development. It allows children to form patterns of needs and desires as they absorb everything around them like a sponge. The demands made by children can drain a parent of emotional energy, but this is normal as it should be. From birth until seven years of age, children mimic behaviors and are led by their experiences which form a baseline for their character. Sesame, Sesame Street, Barney, Teletubbies can form a baseline for children's behavior. Hmm. Children are guided by loving direction by their parents, but when one parent or both fail to appropriate that loving guidance to their child, and instead offer inconsistent or unreliable discipline and direction, healthy narcissistic behavior fades. Abuse from parent to their child can take on many forms. A child is naturally bonded to their parents, especially their mother, as a child is dependent on her for emotional support as his or her mainstay. When this dependence on the primary caregiver is thwarted, belittled, or dismissed through a lack of physical contact and also met with negative emotional stimuli, the child becomes overwhelmed. Fear, terror, and trauma, along with confusion, rule the child's mind. This forms maladaptive behaviors within the child, behaviors that stay with the child for life. No, my book is not on Audible. It's downloadable on Ko-Fi, or you can buy a paperback copy through Amazon, but Amazon will charge you shipping fees. So it's up to you however you want to buy it. I'll post the link for the downloadable copy in the description of this video. Okay, so a mother doesn't always express unconditional love, and because of this, her love for her child becomes inconsistent. Like I said at the beginning of this video, I lightly talked about the Hebraic way of life where everybody practiced unconditional love. And it was an amazing culture. So I further say, but also neglect and overwhelm of the mother can be brought on by hormonal changes that cause depression that can be debilitating for the mother. When conditions are attached to a parent's love for their children, the only source of influence is through mimicry. The child learns to mimic their parent's behavior to gain acceptance, and when this becomes imprinted within the child, it becomes their way of life. Mimicry is a superficial form of obedience and happens during the crucial stage of a child between zero to seven years old. In a household devoid of unconditional love and understanding, the child will express acts of love with little to no emotion. They will give to others what they want in order to gain what they need in return emotionally. This is because mimicry lacks empathy. An unconditional love from a parent nurtures the child as it is the only way to establish confidence, humility, and trust. Without a parent's ability to nurture their child, the child learns to rely on nature, instinct that prevents emotional maturity. Here's a fun fact right here. Fun fact, the brain is the only organ not fully developed at birth. 90% of the brain development occurs during the first five years of a child's life. 
Scientific research and studies on the developing brain show that even at birth, the brain is underdeveloped. It is through the experiences of childhood that develop the brain. With each new experience and each newly learned skill, the brain matures in a specific pattern, starting from the brainstem and midbrain, traveling upwards to the top areas of the cerebral cortex. Oh, I forgot this. Each new experience, the brain develops and modifies itself in direct response. The more an area of the brain is activated, the more neurons or electrical impulses it grows in order to meet the level of learning and cognition. The less an area of the brain is used, the brain adapts in a negative way. The direction of physical development within the brain dictates that if the areas of synaptic responses are not used consistently, then the brain will degenerate those areas of response that are less used. Each time a synapse is created, but not abundantly or consistently used, the brain then absorbs the synapse to the point of disintegration and cannot be regenerated again once the window of opportunity is closed. The limit for this opportunity is the ripe age of five years old. Researchers discovered this amazing developmental pattern while researching the behavioral patterns in feral children. Historically, there have been many instances throughout the world where children have been found in the wild. Most of the documented stories show that children were abandoned and left to fend for themselves. They were discovered living off the land, mimicking a, a behavior of wild animals. Other historical records show that the children survived quite well within the care of animals such as wolves, wild dogs, and even monkeys. I put this book on Udemy and in Udemy, the, the course is like over seven videos long, like seven hours long. And I share with the public on Udemy uh, some videos of feral children that are quite alarming. Like it's really, really sad to see because these kids that are found they are, uh, authorities try to integrate these children back into society and their level of uh, language, they learn primitive words, but they aren't able to form sentences. And oftentimes these kids, they learn how to walk, they learn how to brush their hair and they learn how to eat with a fork and spoon but they usually revert back to their mainstay, sleeping on the floor, taking off their clothes, eating like an animal off the floor. Like it, it's, it's really sad. But uh, in this book, I liken the narcissist to like the underdeveloped brain of, of like a feral child because a narcissist is like a stunted child in an adult's body. So trying to rehabilitize and integrate feral children into society is extremely problematic as the children lack the ability to change their learned behavior and adapt to normal standards of living. As hard as patient caregivers have tried in the past, the wild children were unable to learn simple language skills and could not take direction. Instead, the children favored their standards of living they learned or they were raised in, independent and off the land. Understanding the nature of feral children prompted scientists to set out on a quest to figure out why children who were abandoned to the wild could not become functioning members of society. The research proved that the young brain is highly impressionable. Children have the capacity to learn languages at an early age. They find no difficulty in learning multiple languages simultaneously. However, this ability is short-lived. By the time the child reaches the age of five years old, their pref preferred language is set. While they are still able to learn other languages, they prefer one specific language over another, the one that they most commonly use. Repetition is key for learning, as it turns out repetition is the reason why the brain is able to retain neural pathways that allow the child's language learning to take place. 
And you will see me do repetition in some of my videos. That's why sometimes my videos are very long because I repeat, I've, I'm a homeschooling mom. And once a homeschooling mom, you're always a homeschooling mom. And repetition is key to learning. So please take advantage of that in my videos, okay? Just, just saying. So with regular and consistent learning, strong neural pathways actually develop. And they develop in adults too. With feral children, on the other hand, these neural pathways are lacking because the pathways were stunted or their brains were depleted of them. At the time of abandonment, so like I said earlier that the synopse, if it's not regulated, if there are certain patterns of behavior that do not consistently, are not consistently absorbed by the synopse, the synopse will disintegrate and you can't get that back. That's what we're talking about here. The capacity to learn how to speak or learn new words through speech and visual association are cut off if the child is not consistent in their learning. So this forced the brain to rid itself of the neural and synaptic pathways of language recognition and communication. A feral child literally does not have the ability with their brain to learn new things and go beyond what they learned in the wild. And this is why you see that narcissism can be treated to a point. It can't be cured. Psychologists know that once a narcissist stops the treatment like cognitive behavioral therapy, they revert right back to their narcissism. While in the wild, the child's brain continued to grow and develop, but only in the way of producing repeated behavioral patterns that cannot be outtrained. They can't be redirected or domesticated or omitted. The scientific research shows that by the time a child reaches the age of five, the synopsis and the neural pathways are set. If these pathways are neglected through a lack of use through stimulation, which comes only through learning and experience, then the child actually loses his or her capability to learn, grow, and develop as an independent, creative thinking individual. So I'm going to stop here and go back to our mimicry of puppets. Children are not being taught the facial expressions, the body language, even the micro expressions on the face to understand how to properly feel or conduct themselves when in front of somebody who is showing emotion. And TV shows like Teletubbies and Barney, the Purple Dinosaur and Sesame Street, those puppets are not teaching our children proper behavioral cognition. And it's stunting our children in their brain capacity. Feral children lose their ability to form new sentence structures because they cannot form the basics of understanding. The neurons and the synapses are gone and they cannot be brought back through regeneration and growth. To take this a step further, imagine holding a two-month-old in your arms. Now imagine trying to teach that two-month-old baby to talk and expect that baby to form vowel sounds at the direction of your voice. This isn't going to happen. The baby literally does not have the neural pathways in place to make that speech happen. How they grow the neural pathways is through communication and language that is stimulated in other areas of the brain and also through repetition. They hear sounds and respond to them and they through repeated sensations, they mature and grow in understanding as the brain develops. With each new understanding and learned behavior that forms skill, a new synopsis grows. They grow stronger and more intricate, forming a web linking other experienced pathways together. Makes sense, right? Who knew? The human brain is capable of learning anything at any age, provided that the brain has enough neurons and synaptic connections to accommodate the learning objectives. This is where you might hear neuroplasticity. The synapses 
have to be in place so that more mature and intricate learning outcomes are better understood. In the early stages of life, a child cannot be taught to walk before they can crawl. This is because the neural pathways is not developed enough to receive the entire information. The neurons must first be formed to receive the instinct to crawl. The more the child crawls, the stronger the neural pathways become. Confidence drives the child to push past the adaptation to crawl and progress happens. When progress happens, those neural pathways become stronger and become branching. The branches form a network that transcends learning from crawling to walking to running and from there other exploratory activities that have to do with transportation further grow the neural network. If for some reason the child in infancy never learned to how to crawl, the neurons would never have had a chance to develop. Once the window of opportunity is closed, the child at age five who should be at that time walking cannot and perhaps never will. I came across a video that I showcase on my Udemy channel about a, a young girl who was found, I think she was found at age 12 or 13. She was raised by and abused by her parents and she was made to live in a baby's crib. Yes, even at the age of 13. She went from a crib to a high chair and to a chair. That's all she was allowed to do. And her dad put like a, a wood um, cover over her crib. So she had to lay down. So she was forced to lay down cramped in that crib. So when authorities found her when she was like 12, 13 years old, her walking capabilities was severely stunted. Like she could walk, but it was, her, her walking is not good. So um, yeah, this poor girl, she went through, through torture. The brain has over 100 billion neurons that make specific pathways based on social and communication experiences alone. By the age of two to three years, it is, it is estimated that 85% of the brain's neurological processes are complete. Everything from visual, tactile, oral, and auditory stimulus, including chemical processes in the brain, responds to and retains information at this age. However, in order to develop, the brain needs a consistent supply. If that supply of stimuli is not consistent, areas of information that the brain uses for development are, are lost. What this has to do with narcissism is that, like the feral child, the adult narcissist was created from some sort of childhood emotional neglect. The neglect of having a parent teach the child healthy coping strategies was defunct in the child's narcissist, in much of the same way the feral child was neglected of their right to learn healthy communication and language skills. The child who would grow to live narcissistic tendencies was raised on physical support that lacked emotional compromise. Both types of children, feral or narcissistic, lacked the, fun lacked the fundamental of the human condition, love. When a child does not receive a constant supply of unconditional love with healthy doses of loving direction and discipline, the areas of the brain that filters the love direction emotionally begin to shut down and fade away. I watched videos on childhood development where the child actually was not talked to by their mother. They were given care. The diaper was changed. The the baby was fed, but the child was actually shown no emotion from the mother. This child, children who are shown no emotion, their development is stunted and they show it. They don't want to interact with other kids. They don't know how to interact with other kids. They are aggressive with other kids. They are antisocial. They don't, they are uncomfortable being talked to, 
even looked at, it makes them uncomfortable. This is really, really sad. And the experiments that were done on kids to show this what happens in childhood neglect, it's, it's abhorrent. It is heartbreaking. It's really sad to see. So um, let's see. Okay, so I just have two more pages to go and then we'll wrap this up. So when a child does not receive constant supply of unconditional love with healthy doses of loving direction and discipline, the areas of the brain that filters the love direction emotionally begin to shut down and fade away. Where areas of the brain should be flourishing, these areas become vacant in an empty wasteland. Why do you think a narcissist is emotionally vacant? The brain is then void of synopsis and neural pathways that should have been formed to house positive character traits. Instead, the areas of neurons that were developed for the other areas of growth, such as physical stamina, now have to be challenged now have the challenge to take on emotional direction that was not that it was not designed for do you understand that that if you have a neural think of my finger as a synopsis or a neural pathway that houses emotion and you have another synopsis or neural pathway that houses um flight you know fight or flight um, in the way of actually fighting or running away, physical stimulus. So we've got emotional stimulus, physical stimulus. If emotional stimulus is gone, then the individual has to have their emotional stimulus go and ride a neural pathway that was meant for physical stimulus. So you've got physical and emotional stimulus on the same pattern. That's what we see with narcissism, where a narcissist can mimic and give you physical support, but they cannot differentiate physical and emotional support. Like they lack empathy. They can have camaraderie, camaraderie, whereas like that's where their need for competition comes from. But that competition lacks empathy because they can't navigate that. The individual is not confused. Okay, whoops. Okay. So, um, okay. So the neurons can house these directives, but there exists a lack of understanding through experience with that neural network to properly deliver the emotional directives appropriately. What shows up in the individual's life is dysfunction based on wrong wiring and circuitry. The individual is not confused because their behavior seems natural, even though it is unnatural and cannot understand why their outside peers suggest otherwise. As confusing as this may seem, think of a household electrical outlet. This outlet allows for 125 volt usage. If, however, more electricity is drawn from the outlet, than what it can handle, the circuit overloads and less electricity draws too much for the initial circuit. Oops, I read, read that wrong. Yeah, okay, let me, let me say that again. I thought I read the sentence over again. Okay, so think of this as an electrical outlet. Okay, so you have an 125 voltage. If the circuit overloads, the breaker trips. Without a breaker, the outlet would spark and cause a fire because of the extra electricity drawn is too much for the initial circuit to handle. While the brain is a little bit more complicated than this, the information on the circuitry of the brain for a narcissist compared to a, a normal thinking person, a properly developed person, the circuitry of a properly developed person is too much for the underdeveloped person. And the brain is overstimulated because there literally is not enough synopsis to handle and filter the information coming in. Without experience, the individual does not know how to respond appropriately. 
and the brain does not have the capacity to form healthy chemical reactions to accommodate appropriate responses. So that's why we see a lack of response, a lack of attention, emotional attention in narcissists. They don't know how to properly respond. The superficial adaptations within the neural network are the basis for the fractured ego within the heart of the narcissist. Neuronal overload also forms within the brain and this type of dysfunction is what most likely is the cause for personality disorders and mental illnesses. And this explains why medication and other forms of treatment do not work the best of times. Inconsistent parenting behavior through abuse, neglect, verbal chastisement, stymie the child's character because the child literally has no area in the brain to properly process the abuse. They cannot correctly alter their behavior in forgiveness, avoidance, or any other behavioral modification outcomes to satisfy or meet anyone's expectations and approval. The child who did not receive neglect but instead too much attention and adoration from the parent. The child was excessively favored, doted on and spoiled on. They also receive the same negative neural pathways within the brain, but this is opposite of the child who is neglected. The neglected child's mind filters out superficialities of niceties on the neural pathway. So the child who is neglected, if they're given compliments, they'll dismiss those compliments because they can't filter those compliments in their neural pathways. But a child who was given compliments and overcompensated, oh, you're the best, oh, you're so good. Oh, a child who, who is raised like that and as an adult isn't given compliments, they don't know how to take that either. They don't know how to filter that because there's no filter to accommodate such neglect. The behavior of a narcissist is reactionary based on learned instinct behavior, and that forever has them on the defensive. Depending on the childhood abuse, whether they're had overweening parents or neglectful parents. The narcissist as an adult is destined to form or destined to become a vulnerable or grandiose narcissist forever seeking acceptance. So the child who, the child who was not um, given compliments forms narcissism where the narcissist needs and thrives being complimented. And the child who was given compliments as a, as a child forms adult narcissists who demands compliments or doesn't need them. So it, it, it depends. It's, what I'm trying to say is it's not dependent on the, the type of narcissist, the grandiose, the vulnerable, the Machiavanelli, it, it depends on the brain wiring and the structure. So for your consideration, a narcissist is someone that I liken to a feral child. While a feral child was left to defend themselves on their own, abandoned to the wild, a, a narcissist is a child that has been left to defend themselves within the family home. A narcissist has to depend on instinct while living among strangers in their own home. These strangers whom the child is dependent on, they, this child has no choice but to adapt and take their cues based on what they see. So that's the end of the chapter of this book. So, Understanding this, what we just learned about the brain and the development of the brain, this for me makes it very clear that Sesame Street and Barney and Teletubbies and other like cartoons are not healthy for kids. They're entertainment, but a child doesn't know entertainment as entertainment. 
And even as adults, even watching this right now, watching me or watching TV, what you're learning is actually filtered into your theta brainwave. And it's getting in there and it's brainwashing you. When you watch TV, some of the, the things that you learn, why, why do you think that there's certain symbols in the background of the scene that, that you're watching? Is to get into your subconscious, your theta wave, and imprint itself in there so that the next time you see it, consciously your theta wave will bring more of that to you god tells us what we reap we sow or we sow what we reap or we reap what we sow there we go we reap what we sow and our thoughts don't stay with us our thoughts spread out into this harvest field this ether either through speech or through thought. It is scientifically proven that the five brain waves are that travel through our nervous system. We have neurons in our brains, we have neurons in our hearts, and we have neurons in our guts, our, our intestines. And they the three communicate with each other. And the heartbeat produces an electromagnetic wave that actually goes out there into this harvest field and is absorbed by other people. Our thoughts go out there as a wave, electric wave. This is our heart is an electromagnetic wave. Our thoughts are electric waves. Together, they go out there into this harvest field and they're absorbed by other people. And they also bring other people to us. Like attracts like. It's scientifically proven. It's not woohoo. It's not demonic. It's not. It's scientifically proven. This is how God created us. Energy is what the Bible calls spirit. And when Jesus trans, uh, the transfiguration when Jesus allowed his light to shine, his disciples were scared because this was something that was not seen, but it was meant to be seen. It was something that everybody was meant to do. Jesus gave us this direction, let your light shine. Let the light of Jesus shine in our hearts. We are to be so holy, so on fire for him in the way that we change our likeness, our character, like his, that we literally will let his light, white light shine. And some people have that capability. You do too. You just don't know it. You've got to teach yourself. And that's why 72 books of the Bible were edited out by Emperor Constantine because these books taught the, the spirit nature of the human body. And what science calls energy, the Bible calls spirit. And you know, you know, if you don't know Roman history, you know this much, that Romans were conquerors. They tried to take over the world. And so with Constantine editing the Bible that we have, and taking out 72 books of the Bible that were on the teachings of Jesus, by the way. You can be sure that he did that for a reason, because we would be able to be conquerors today. We wouldn't have the need for governments. There would be no lockdowns. There would be no masks. There would be none of it. There would be no need to police. There would be no need for doctors and lawyers. The light that we let shine is powerful. Telepathy, 
clairvoyance. Um, yeah, that light in us, when Jesus said, speak to that mountain, be thou removed, new, removed into the sea, and it will obey with just the, the faith of a mustard seed. Your energy is power. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. And the enemies of God, the enemies who killed Jesus, the Roman army killed Jesus. They strung Jesus up. They hung him on a cross. The Roman army collaborated with the, not, not the Hebrew government. They collaborated with the Jewish government, the Judaism. The people that Jesus was overthrowing by his power of his spirit. When Jesus was alive, that's when Judaism came into effect and the Kabbalah and the Talmud, not the Talmud, the, the yeah, the Talmud. I was thinking the Torah. The Torah is the true book. It's the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, which is the false Bible of the, the Jewish doctrine. And Jesus, through his miracles and his teachings, were unraveling those doctrines of men and Constantine he put an end to that like there I watched a video I forget what it was called but <clears throat> it was a historical documentary about the Romans and how Constantine was actually putting to death people who were following Christ and, he, and Constantine was burning people. And he was trying to uh, overthrow the, the Christianity at that time. Um, and what was happening was when people died, they were having their books, not the Bible, but their, their portions of the books of the Holy Scriptures. They were having those portions buried with them so that Constantine couldn't burn them and do away with them. So there are texts of Jesus's extra teachings out there. We just don't know where they are. So we're doing the best that we can with the knowledge that we have. And now we're in the information age where revelation tells us that knowledge will be given to us. And yeah, we've got the knowledge. We're allowed to pray for wisdom. We're allowed to pray for knowledge. Knowledge is given to us by God himself. And God is opening up the floodgates of knowledge to teach and guide us. Because God loves us so much that he's like, no, you guys are going home. You guys have been suffering enough without my word. So I'm going to share with you what science can validate. So I dismiss science when God is taken out. So the science that I learn, I try to do my best to find where it can be backed up with God and um, the Hebrew word. Fascinating. Fascinating. So Wow, we're two minutes, two, two minutes, two, it seems like two minutes. We're two hours and 14 minutes in, so I think we have discussed enough. If you guys have comments, questions, or suggestions, please use my email. I will get to you um, as soon as I get the email. I will message you as soon as I can. And if you guys need to talk, if you guys have you know, questions about your trauma, about healing. I am just an email away, and you can actually book a time with me to talk with me on video conferencing for an hour. 
if that's something that you want to do, just email me and I can set you up with that and we can do that. I'm, I'm here for you guys. And I just want to say thank you for watching. Thank you for staying up with me. And you guys are a blessing to me. So thank you very much. And go have a good night's sleep. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And I will see you back here tomorrow with another video. Be blessed. Bye-bye. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. Don't make me go. I got to go. I gotta, it's, it's late here. It's after 12 here. So good night, everyone. Thanks. This was fun. Okay. I'm going. Bye. Bye. Bye.